Great. Well, thank you. It's an honor to chat with you all. Uh, it was a dream realized for me to actually get down to Australia, uh, first time down into that part of the Southern Hemisphere for me. And of course, one of my dreams is to get back there and actually do some diving and actually see some of the countryside. So you, you live in a very beautiful part of the world. Uh, so hopefully this will lead to more opportunities for me to meet up with you all down, <clears throat> down there or up there, depending on your point of view. So anyways, we can move beyond the, uh, uh, the brag slide just showing different organizations <clears throat> and my, my books, which have been in, in translation. So this talk is about uh, artificial intelligence, AI, and specifically machine learning and how it's going to impact high performance computing pretty much all throughout the, uh, uh, the industry and, and throughout the community. So let's go back to a little bit of a historical perspective. So what kicked off this, uh, this revolution is uh, at least the last bandwagon, bandwagon is that GPUs came out and uh, they were essentially really good at pushing pixels. And what we saw is essentially a battle for this billion dollar market to develop games. And of course, most of us have played video games of some kind or another. Then NVIDIA came up with a great idea that we could actually do programming of these GPUs in a high level language like C, C++ or Fortran uh, ATI at the time came back and said, no, you don't need CUDA or that. We can just work with OpenCL. Along the way, uh, ATI became part of AMD and advanced micro devices. And what we saw is that basically GPUs became this very powerful, massively parallel programmable device with very high bandwidth. And it's the memory bandwidth that's as important as the degree of parallelism. Meanwhile, we also saw that CPUs, processors, were starting to run out of um, oomph as far as scalable speed ups. You could no longer, essentially because of the physics, the failure of Dennard scaling laws, you could no longer increase the clock rate of CPUs to run faster and faster. So people had to, scientists in particular, had to start investigating parallelism. So Intel was sitting over on the side saying, well, we can still continue with business as usual. Then sales got to 100 million GPUs and Intel started waking up a little bit and rumbling a little bit and they tried a project called Larrabee which didn't do very much but then sales reached a half a billion and there are now multiple billions of uh, GPUs now out there and Intel woke up and entered the, the foray and now the current offering from the CPU perspective is called Intel Xeon Scalable processors and they have neural networks, speed ups and, and other uh, AI accelerators, which becomes important to the HPC community in a moment, which we will investigate in a moment. So there's various families that they're working with. <clears throat> so I'm a heretic and I point out that because memory bandwidth is basically the key, CPUs are also good for artificial intelligence. So don't get locked into thinking that you have to have a GPU. We'll investigate this deeper a little later in the talk, but the key point is that most processing devices, both CPUs and GPUs, have enough computational performance to maximize, essentially run, uh, process all the data that can come out of the memory subsystem as quickly as possible. So basically at the moment, memory bandwidth is the key to performance. So here's kind of a, um, a sneak preview into the future for different types of processors from the Intel perspective. Now let's take a look and uh, see how the machine learning technology kind of proceeded um, well up to our current point of 2000. So I was very lucky in that in the 1940s, 50s and 60s and way back when, people started using something called a perceptron where they were investigating machine learning. And where I was lucky is that um, two scientists, Minsky and Papert came out and showed that because people were using straight lines to essentially try and solve these problems, that there was a whole class of, of, of computational problems that could not be solved. And that basically was encapsulated in something called the XOR problem. And they showed that basically you couldn't solve a huge class of problems because you couldn't um, have a perceptron learn to solve the XOR problem, which has basically four examples, two inputs, uh, one output from each because it's nonlinear. And because you can't do XOR, you essentially can't um, uh, 
build, have the neural network or the perceptron in this case, learn all the gates that are used in a digital computer, which is uh, computationally universal. Hence, perceptrons were not computationally universal. <laughs> then basically, Romhart came out with backpropagation and they used something called a sigmoid, which was able to solve the XR problem. Hence, um, artificial neural networks using nonlinear um, activation functions were demonstrated to be computationally universal. In theory, they could solve any computational problem that we can solve with our brains, any computational problem that we can solve with a digital computer. And so I was very lucky. I uh, uh, was able to jump in and do a number of papers. If you look on the Tech Enablement website, you can see I've got 45 or something peer-reviewed journal papers from around that period of time. And, <clears throat> um, and really, the industry took off. And that was in the 1990s. I was very lucky in that we met up with uh, a group of investors and we actually um, uh, created a computational drug discovery company using machine learning, which we sold to a, uh, uh, to a major pharma. So this computational universality is, is important. And the XR problem um, is essentially illustrated with that little neural network representation where you have the two inputs. Um, you can see my uh, cursor, my, my mouse pointer move. So you essentially provide the, uh, the one zero, the binary representation. You have this nonlinear function, which then uh, predicts the output. Well, you can map that as a surface, as Alan and I, Alan Lapides and I showed, and it demonstrating how the neural networks actually work. So in an example of one of the best ways to communicate a complex concept, very simply, because science is as much about showmanship, I hate to say, as um, as doing good science because you have to communicate the concepts out to other people. So Terry Sanowski created a wonderful example called NetTalk where he was able to show up with just a, uh, uh, a tape recorder. And I will actually play the example for you. If you remember when we did the, um, uh, the preparation for this talk, you'll have to, I'll be quiet, you'll have to turn up the volume, turn it down again after the first sound bite finishes because I'll speak. And this way people will be able to hear it. So here's what happens when Terry uh, trained up a neural network and stopped it partway through when it's trying to learn essentially how to translate English text to the phonemes, the sounds that we make in trying to make a, learn, a neural network learn to read aloud. So here we go, turn up the volume please. Hopefully my voice is not booming out at the moment, um, but that's stopping the network partway through. So it's trying to find a way to a global solution. The problem is it hasn't gotten there yet. And, and actually it's an interesting bit of, uh, of psychology that Terry actually had to use a child's voice because people got um, weirded out if they used an adult voice speaking and babbling. But what the network tries to do is it tries to go down and find a global uh, minimum uh, on an energy surface when it's doing the training. And here's what it sounds like when it finds a solution. Please turn the volume up again. I like to go to my grandmother's house. Well, because she gives us cookie. So hopefully the volume is now turned down again. So this illustrates that the network, uh, just based on a training data set alone, was able to learn a very complex problem in seconds and now in, in basically a microsecond with the, with the GPU, um, which takes humans years to, to learn. Basically from data, it learned to read aloud and that's actually the basis of the machine reading that we hear on Google and a number of other um, uh, application platforms. It can work in multiple languages. It's a wonderful general useful uh, solution, all because we can actually use these uh, nonlinear neural networks to solve computational problems. So Alan and I said, well, you know, this is not a one trick pony. So we actually showed it regions of DNA that coded for proteins and regions that didn't. And we essentially had it start learning to read DNA aloud to tell us where the coding regions are, which was quite valuable for the human genome project. So now let's take a look at the computational problem and what the uh, basis of this performance is called SIMD, single instruction, multiple data, because you have this high degree of parallelism. SIMD um, is a subset of the general computational model, model called MIMD. You can look these up if you want, but basically SIMD is the reason why GPUs are so space and power efficient.
because essentially it simplifies the complexity. Um, and the first instantiation of that was on the connection machine, which started using a mapping I created to uh, train uh, neural networks very efficiently in a very scalable fashion. And so here's uh, an example way back when of a $30 million connection machine, which actually your cell phone now is more powerful than that um, uh, particular $30 million device. Here's an older result from 2013 showing that yes, indeed, on both the CPU-based um, uh, uh, examples, uh, namely the Intel Xeon Phi, that you can get up to a teraflop of uh, sustained performance when training. Well, it wasn't until the late 1990s that the HPC community was able to access a machine that could actually run a trillion floating point operations per second. You also see the green line down very low down here, which shows the impact of the memory bandwidth because the, um, uh, the Westmere processor that we had just um, sat, the CPU was sitting idle most of the time because it was just sitting and waiting for the memory subsystem. And so that's a teraflop per second. Well, the training is actually scalable in a distributed environment. So here's an example of mine from uh, 2014 running some example, some machine learning examples that I've used for uh, uh, quite a long time now, uh, showing that we got to 13 petaflops average sustained training performance using 16,384 GPUs. So this mapping, which we can then scale out as large as we want, basically uses uh, some kind of a numerical method. Um, it could be any sort of black box that, that is out there. There's huge numbers of packages. And what happens is that basically we have all these computational devices. Here I illustrated GPUs. They could be computational nodes uh, using CPUs. They could be ASICs, they could be FPGAs, any sort of computational device. So what happens is that basically you are doing an energy minimization and so you broadcast the model parameters to all the computational devices. Well, this is, occurs in basically constant time. Think of a television model, is it takes just as much time to broadcast to one television as every television on the planet. So that's constant time. Similarly, what we are doing is we're calculating error. So each of the computational devices calculates its partial error. That's strong scaling. If you have a thousand devices, you run a thousand times faster. If it's, you have a million devices, and of course enough examples, you run a million times faster. So you can scale this as, as far as you want, as far as big data, which is important. Then the only restriction to this linear scaling is the reduction, which occurs in log time because it uses a tree structure. And that's why this is a near linear uh, scalable uh, example. One second, please. Sorry, I didn't want to uh, clear my throat in, in, uh, in, your, in your ears. So this uh, maps beautifully onto a GPU model and a CPU model. And that's why we see basically the straight line scaling on the uh, uh, Oak Ridge Titan um, system as we scale out to 13,000 GPUs. And the point that I always teach to students is, Always report honest flops. Look at the entire time, uh, including computation and communication, um, because that's really what dictates time to model. And a, an important um, point to also look at is, remember that black box we talked about? That black box defines the convergence time. In other words, how many iterations, how many trials it has to make to get to the model. So if you have a good computational method, say a gradient-based one, you're going to have orders of magnitude faster convergence than if you're running with a gradient-free model. So let's now start moving into the applications of this. And if you remember, these are all basically uh, phrased with the same structure as the net talk. So you have some text down here that goes through a neural network, some internal connections, and you get the phoneme that's to be pronounced. And we heard that ourselves with our ears. And I also mentioned the work that um, Alan Lapides and I did with other uh, uh, collaborators. And basically what we did is we showed it the, uh, uh, the DNA. Well, it turns out that you can also predict protein binding affinity. And this is actually the basis of the company that I started that we sold to a major pharma. So basically we looked at initially at an antigen, uh, antibody antigen binding complex. And, you know, the schematic looks, you know, understandable. But then you start looking at actually the details of how the biology works. And oh my goodness, it's starting to get really complicated. And then you delve down actually to the structure activity relationship. And it's like, oh my goodness, uh, I am not being able to really understand this as clearly as I want to. 
And then you start looking at the electron microscope and you know, good luck with that, in my opinion. So what we did though is using machine learning, we then approached our investors and um, we told them and, and talked with them and they said, well, yeah, we agree that you're smart guys and you have some really cool technology. But basically the question which we had to answer and which in any sort of an AI application that you're going to be working on, you have to answer as well is, how do we know that you're not just playing expensive computer games with our money? And so validation is a key part of machine learning as it is with any HPC project. So what we did is, again, this is the same structure as, um, as the NetTalk example, is we took essentially the protein structure. Well, there's uh, 20 amino acids, and not the protein structure, the protein sequence, apologies about that. There's 20 amino acids and we had six positions, so we had 64 million um, possible examples in this, in this learning space. And so we went to our uh, favorite wacky chemists who made the examples and they said, well, we actually have this data laying around, but it's only one to 2,000 kind of random examples because we sampled really heavily in some regions of that chemical space, the 64 million space. And some regions, you have absolutely no information, which reflects actually what happens when you're looking at a huge problem with a, with a much, much longer protein chain. So that's approximately 0.001% sampling of the surface. So can you actually learn and train a neural network to solve a problem with such a limited bias set of examples? Well, the way we did it is we trained it and essentially it's like NetTalk and the other examples is we gave the um, uh, amino acid sequence and predicted binding affinity for the data that we had. Well, that gave us a uh, function and I'll not go too mathematical on this so you don't have to be worried is that basically it gave us a function where we presented the um, amino acid sequence coded for the inferencing operation and that gave us the binding affinity. Trained up with beautiful low error, so we had a good confidence, so we had actually learned some kind of model that reflects this translation, this model from uh, amino acid to, uh, to binding affinity. Then what we did is we used a hill climbing method where we started out and on the lowest position, just one of the positions, uh, we changed the value, you can see here the V, L, and F, and basically pick the highest value from that, change the second position, as you can see here, and we just basically kept walking up the, uh, the hill until we finally found an example, put our money where our mouth is and said, this has the highest binding affinity, and more than that, we think it has six orders of magnitude, magnitude, higher binding affinity than anything we've seen before. The chemist went out and made it, and verified experimentally with, um, with binding affinity experiments and showed it works. Well, guess what? You just learned how to, uh, the first step in doing your own computational drug discovery company, okay? Well, you can also do this, a lot of people are focusing on deep learning right now. And I just want to point out that neural networks, AI is very good for also learning models, say from time series data. So here we have data sampled at regular intervals. Uh, sorry about that, I just stepped backwards. Uh, sampled at intervals time t, time t minus one, time t minus two, and so on, and is predicting, predicting time t plus one. Same structure as, a, as all the different neural network examples that we provided before. So what we are doing is now we're learning this function that predicts the next uh, sample in that time series. It could be stock prices, it could be gold prices, it could be whatever time series information you, you have. We actually looked at bifurcation diagrams for turbines, for example. Um, that's a lot of the different papers that we have. But basically, we have a nonlinear crystal ball. Now, we have this model, uh, which is a system model showing us that we can start investigating computationally the behavior of the system. So here's how we do our nonlinear crystal ball. Is notice, on the first step, we predict time t plus one. Well, once we get that prediction, we could then move that prediction so that we've got t plus one now in the input, and we're predicting time t plus two and we can just keep walking forward in time. And actually that's how our paper describes how neural networks work uh, that I did with Alan Lapides. And if we look at the room mean square error as we move out in time for a very complex system, it's orders of magnitude better than the best predictive methods. So don't think of AI as just pattern recognition, looking at pictures. You can also do a huge amount of other work. This is based on the historical work. So here with a uh, colleague of mine at Princeton and Johns Hopkins University, we actually trained up using essentially a uh, fourth order Runge-Kutta, we actually trained up a neural network to be the system of equations 
which we could then investigate outside of the machine learning uh, framework. And it actually works really well for stiff systems. And that's how we actually did the bifurcation analysis to find out when the turbines start vibrating in different modes and might, for example, uh, impact the, uh, the housing of the jet engine, for example, if you get enough buffering in, on the engine. So that's an, one example. The other is the curse of dimensionality. Just to see if y'all are awake, how many of you know what the curse of dimensionality is? Can I see a raise of hands at all? Okay. So basically the idea is with the curse of dimensionality is we're all used to working in, in a three-dimensional space. So we can see around us who's nearest, in, nearest to us in, in the room, who's furthest away, and virtually me, I'm very far away. So we're used to working in that, in that environment. Well, if you look, if you bump up to higher dimensional spaces, you'll see this in a, um, uh, in a database. Uh, but if you're investigating a 2D region, then we're looking inside of a circle. If you're looking 3D, then you're looking in that database in terms of a sphere. If you're looking in four dimensions, and I can wave my hands and, and y'all will start laughing because I can't really describe a four dimensional space. But the region, the volume of space that you have to examine grows exponentially. So it turns out that for higher dimensional problems, when you do a search to find out who's my nearest neighbor, you either get no responses or you get everybody because in some sense in high dimensional data, everybody is your nearest neighbor. So what we do is we essentially take our high dimensional data, which we might get from uh, a data stream that has a lot of sensors. We might have a thousand sensors or even a million. I don't care. So we have our sensor data coming in. And what we do is we define a bottleneck neuron. And what we do, if you see my cursor, is that we flip this input so that we have to reconstruct the input vector at the output. And I'm only showing the bottleneck neurons here. We're running it through bottleneck, forcing it to do uh, essentially an encoding, a nonlinear encoding. And we have the output vector. We can check the error for how far away it is from the input vector. When we train, it adjusts these networks so that the whole encoding scheme actually reconstructs the output vector at the input. If you get that with low error, then guess what? That means that your encoding represents in a low dimensional space on a lower dimensional manifold um, all the data. Well, guess what? We can start looking, say if it's in 3D, we can actually start looking. And here's the example. We get our 3D data. We can actually visualize that. So not only can you do a, use neural networks as a nonlinear crystal ball, you can also use it as a visualization tool to examine really complicated data, okay? So this brought us up, this is not a, um, a, a, a historical talk, but we had a huge, huge um, a bandwagon effect with all this capability. What happened is in the late 90s, early 2000s, is that this, this idea is simple. All you do is present data to this magical thing that figures out how to solve the, solve the problem. <laughs> and I'm done. Everybody's an expert. And so what happened is the investment community, all they heard about were all these, you know, incredible claims over what machine learning AI can do and what the, uh, um, what the research uh, grant uh, organizations were getting were these, all these um, proposals saying, we'll do these wonderful, extraordinary things. Well, the people didn't understand the drawbacks of, what was, of the technology they were working with. So many of those projects failed that the funding agency said, oh, you're using machine learning. We don't fund those anymore. The investor said, ah, you know, we got burned on a couple AI projects. Go talk to these other guys down the street. They, they have money and maybe they might be interested. So we actually had, the, the field died because it just became so popular, okay? Wildly overpromised. Then what happened eventually is uh, Jeff Hinton and a couple other people came up with what we're now seeing as deep neural networks and uh, which basically is modeled off of um, mother nature. So we're essentially modeling what goes on in the mammalian V1 through V5 layers of the visual cortex and which is deep mini co uh, connections and it does convolutions and suddenly you're starting to see commercially viable um, solutions where there's where um, actually image recognition is actually working and it's working quite well and it's provably working well and it's working well actually in the field as well. I've got some funny stories, which unfortunately I don't really have time for at the, at the, at the moment. Um, we'll see at the end. So suddenly there was this huge resurgence. We also had that combined with the introduction of GPUs. So we circled back to not only are we now running on machines that run faster than your cell phone, but we have a commercially viable application with these machines that can now do teraflops to petaflops to exaflops of training performance. 
So the model paradigm that I want to stress, which unfortunately I can't stress as much as I want in this talk, is we modeled mother nature. Is essentially we started with perceptrons using straight lines, mathematically easy. We added these sigmoids, which are the crudest approximation of what mother nature does because real neurons, they saturate. If you give them too much of a voltage, they saturate and they don't produce infinite amounts of voltage out. Similarly, on the low end, if you don't give them a strong enough stimulus, they don't respond. But there's this nice linear regime in between. That's that sigmoid in the activation function. The next step is we started modeling mother nature again and with these, uh, with these deep neural networks. And every time we do it, we get this huge expansion in what we can do with machine learning. So now, all of a sudden, we've got another bandwagon. And um, please don't uh, contribute to the bandwagon of, wagon effect that, um, that killed the, uh, the field before. So now we're able to run and train and work with artificial neural networks in an exascale framework. So here's an example of a bunch of different problems, which I'll just mention. If you look at the slides again, this might provide some of the directions for your interest in research. So now deep learning is com commercially viable. It basically does what we do. Amazingly, it can now recognize faces and do vision recognition patterns better than humans can. And basically, it's just having all these deep uh, layers of um, uh, processing so you can actually break up the picture exactly how the mammalian visual cortex does it, and it works really quite nice. So there's huge amounts of applications. Also, people are now using these deep neural networks for speech recognition, not just reading aloud. So there is everything we talked about plus more. So it's wonderful. Now, in previous years, um, I really wanted to get machine learning into the heart of HPC, which is modeling and simulation. And many of you are probably from the modeling and simulation community. And the conversation went really well. Uh, you know, we can do this and the inferencing, by the way, I haven't mentioned, but it can be orders, in fact, six orders of magnitude faster than competing um, uh, HPC methods like uh, Monte Carlo methods. So there's all these computational benefits, but we always got killed by that one question is, how do we know that you're not doing, that you can't tell me how that neural network works. So how do we know that you're not going to introduce some non-physical artifact into my physics-based simulation? And the milestone uh, 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 example was done at CERN by Sophia uh, Valacorsa and a number of other people at the CERN Open Lab where they actually, in the ivory tower of physics-based simulation, use something called a generative adversarial network. And um, what that means is that instead of trying to explicitly model the process, they model the distribution of the process. And they do so well that you can't uh, distinguish between the physics-based distributions uh, from the real distributions, from the neural network learned distributions, from um, basically from data. So suddenly now, Neural networks are now part of the HPC community. Here's how closely the data corresponds to the real observations. CERN is ecstatic about this because they're getting six orders of magnitude faster predicted capability, which means that researchers can use laptops, they can use conventional processors to actually start running this giant simulation. And it gives them a path forward to go to the next level of luminosity with the uh, LHC because that uh, increases the data by about three orders of magnitude. But if you've gotten a six order magnitude speed up, you can actually start working with and validating in models what you expect to see on this real, very expensive piece of equipment. So um, basically now we have, um, here's an example. Um, basically a full Monte Carlo runs in 17,000 <laughs> milliseconds. It's 0.04 milliseconds when, when doing the batch inferencing operations on the GPUs. Now you see the performance, and now you see why you want to, for your HPC applications, modeling and simulation, you want to start working with, with those technologies, okay? So now we're able to, uh, here's another application where researchers at NERSC um, are using climate models, and they can actually run these climate models many times faster than humans can actually process the data. So what they do is they use essentially deep neural networks to recognize and classify, is this weather system a hurricane? Is it a thunderstorm? What is it? And with that, they're able to run their simulations, their climate simulations from way back in the past, uh, sorry, and, um, and then look to see if the climate simulation 
generates the same distribution of storms that were actually observed in real life. Again, it's answering that question, how do we know that you're not playing expensive computer games with our money? Got it? You know, it's, it's, the talk basically centers around just a couple key concepts. And so validation is one of the concepts that you have to really encompass and start working with. The other is, is that these are great for actual HPC modeling and simulation um, applications. And if you want to uh, uh, point to the future, every time we model what Mother Nature does, which we will follow up in a little later in this talk, is we get a huge expansion in the capability of, of our AI systems. So anyways, um, today we're working on general purpose devices like CPUs and GPUs. That was at the beginning of the part of the talk. Um, tomorrow we're gonna start working with field programmable gate arrays and ASICs, uh, data flow devices. And we'll look at near-term neuromorphic and then far term is quantum seems to be ideal for training once we have the qubits. The thing is, is quantum at the moment, it, um, a friend of mine described it once as quantum computing is basically computer science 101 at Hogwarts School of Magic. It's really magic. And um, the key message to take away for quantum computing is um, small data, big compute. Neural networks are data intensive, big data, and you know, memory bandwidth limited compute. So here's kind of the different camps that we're looking at in the near term. And um, the point of this slide is not only can you use these new machine learning technologies for your modeling and simulation, but you can look at new numerical methods. So one of the things that we found out is that in Mother Nature, apologies about my, my phone, uh, that Mother Nature uh, doesn't have a high precision computing um, uh, framework up here. It's really noisy. The wetware is, you know, it's amazing how the collective behavior actually lets us think rationally most of the time. So people are starting to follow up on that by using, performing reduced precision arithmetic, um, including, um, including um, uh, floating point 16 and 8-bit math, which seems too small to do useful things, not so much. In fact, the NLAFET um, library actually does a basic linear algebra uh, BLOS type of uh, um, uh, library, which is drop in that uses these redu reduced precision operations that are now available on CPUs and that are also available on GPUs and, of course, in FPGAs to speed up the computation of these core linear algebra methods in your HPC methods. And you get the same resolution. Sorry, I've got 2x speed. Uh, about that. But again, it boils down to memory bandwidth is basically if you're using FP16, that means that you can get two ops worth of data, two um, operands worth of data in one memory fetch compared to a 32-bit. So you get a 2x speed up. With int 8, you can get four, so you get a 4x speed up, which is, which is wonderful. And here's some, uh, some examples also then, uh, since we're moving to parallelism, there's libxsmm. Um, all of these are available for download. Um, showing that you can do batched reduced precision small matrix operations, which is a huge class of HPC applications that can use these, uh, uh, these benefits to the hardware from AI to run your conventional uh, modeling and simulation applications with drop-in libraries faster, 2x or 4x faster in, in some of the key, key codes. That can give you a 10, 20%, 30% boost in actual uh, runtime performance, which is huge when you're running on a very expensive leadership class supercomputer, um, because that basically means the machine can do 10 to 20% more work, and at the price of these things, uh, that's, that's important. Meanwhile, you're also able to run your own codes that much faster and get results closer to real time. Um, meanwhile, new, it's also stimulated new research for those who are numerically inclined. There's the HICMA library, which is, again, a drop-in library using these same techniques of reduced precision, but they're actually using full precision. You can run on your gigabyte uh, memory workstation, you can do million by million matrix operations. Think of that, million by million, a million squared data items um, in a sparse, uh, sparse matrix, and you can run that in a gigabyte workstation now. So you can start approaching huge, huge problems, okay? many, many benefits. That's why I say the impact of AI is everywhere. It's not just neural networks. Think of the applications, but
but think of what's happening to the basic libraries that we're using. So you need to pay attention to, to this. Uh, what's coming forward, Jack Don Guerra, for, for uh, leader in the uh, uh, in the community, is actually um, structuring the NLAFET library using DAGs, directed acyclic graphs. So what that means is that instead of doing the calculation, the library actually structures the calculation into this DAG graph data structure, which can then be compiled down to support um, uh, whatever the particular um, uh, hardware platform is, including FPGAs. And one of the jokes that I uh, always like to, to mention is with FPGAs, um, they're very, very difficult to program. This makes it transparent to the user. Uh, in a general purpose supercomputer or workstation, when something breaks, people are in the hallways yelling and screaming for the system management team to come out and fix it. With, an, uh, with a uh, FPGA-based project, when something actually works, people are out in the hallways yelling and screaming, cheering that they actually got something to work. So this is a big step forward in using these um, really powerful devices that um, are very power efficient and can keep, keep the data local. So, now we're looking at HPC going to edge devices, and there's a beautiful BDEC, Big Data and Extreme Cell Computing Report, um, done by a friend of uh, uh, several friends of mine, which um, which basically shows, if you look at this at this illustration, is that even HPC centers as well as data centers are going to be just way off in the distance because we're going to be starting to work with these uh, IoT edge devices to bring in a lot of data, run that through. Okay, let's step back. You're going to have zillions of sensor data items. Gee, do you think that maybe that dimension reduction um, uh, from the bottleneck neurons could be useful in crunching that down to eliminate uh, communications bottlenecks to make the data visualizable and useful? Hopefully, um, that will prove true, and you've learned something very useful in in this in this talk. So, the other is is that cloud is now becoming a uh, um, a, a viable solution. And Dan Stanzione, the director of um, uh, the TAC, Texas Advanced Computing Center, Supercomputing Center, when he gave a talk at the last supercomputing conference, pointed out it's the largest academic supercomputing. They're doing all this work where they're actually giving people um, cloud accounts because the cloud providers are always running trying to provide the newest, latest hardware because it's a competitive commercial market. So by giving their academic users the ability to run in the cloud, the actual scientists are able to investigate new hardware approaches to existing HPC problems. And Dan uh, gave his talk and everyone was stunned at this complete about phase from the traditional, um, the supercomputer is God and we will run on that to this more uh, distributed approach. And nobody asked any questions. So he looked at me and said, Farber, I know, I know you, you've got a question. And I said, well, Dan, I mean, basically, I'm trying to first get um, my jaw off the ground because actually I never thought I would use the word agile and HPC supercomputer in the same sentence without a knot in between because they have actually made an agile supercomputer. So the systems that you're going to be running on in the future are going to completely change. Uh, there's also big data services. So not bad for surface fitting. And as uh, Alan Lapidus and I showed that basically what how neural networks work is they use that signal to create bumps. That's why neural networks are a big data problem because you have to essentially get representative data at the important bumps. And I use importance with the quotes. Hopefully you can see my fingers doing the air quotes um, because we don't really know what they are. What we do is we run the problem, look at a cross validation set and if it doesn't work, we try and get more data which hopefully hits those important points of inflection to build the bumps or fit the valleys so that we get this surface, as you can kind of see from this, uh, from our paper of how neural networks work. We're just doing surface fitting. That's all neural networks are doing right now. So what happens is then the neural network during training learns the surface and then it interpolates two points on the surface. Well, that's very high accuracy. It can also extrapolate out from the surface uh, to predict uh, new points that it hasn't seen before, and that's less accurate. So that's kind of some of the constraints on your inferencing. But basically, neural networks are a big data problem because as dimensionality increases, the number of bumps or the complexity of the problem increases, the number of bumps increase in both cases, in some, ca in some examples, exponentially. So you have to be lucky like we did with our uh, drug discovery company where the bumps aren't too bad. But as we get to self-driving cars and more and more complicated problems, you get to big data. So the example I like to use is I got a birthday card one year that said herpes bathtub. And I'm like, oh my goodness. 
And inside the card, it said, happy birthday, damn voice recognition, because they didn't get the training data to be at the right bumps. So you get the point. Um, I just put this uh, slide in. It's a beautiful one from an article I'm writing, working with Intel uh, yesterday, actually, but I got permission to do this. So what we're seeing is how the um, number of parameters grow on the x-axis versus the size of the data. Our current benchmarks are actually really small. So when you're looking at your procurements, this is where the vendors are trying to make you focus. Well, here's that CERN example that I said that is so milestone changing. Well, we're getting in medical data sets and in oil and gas simulations, we're actually getting um, uh, models that have uh, 5.9 billion parameters. We're not talking hundreds, thousands, millions, we're talking billions. So that's why the reduced precision, which also consumes less memory space, is important, okay? We're also getting big data sets, uh, as I just gave you that whole analysis on fitting bumps, the data sets are getting bigger and bigger. So the good thing is, is that we can scale to as many computational units as we need to, to train, and we get this six order of magnitude faster inferencing. So my claim is, is that AI types of applications are actually going to become more and more important in the future, just because of those computational regions. The other is, be real careful when you look at GPU versus CPU versus other benchmarks, because we're only investigating a small part. Memory bandwidth is key. That's the king to this whole problem. So now we're looking at new memory uh, uh, subsystems and storage access. The first is we're now actually starting to put storage, non-volatile memory, actually as a DIM that plugs into the memory bus. Okay, that means that then we can create, believe it or not, terabyte memory workstations. So we're changing the definition of what, um, uh, of what but is actually a fat note. More than that is Lenovo, you can go and take a look at their white paper when they're using these Intel Optane DCPMM, which is the first instantiation of this, is that we get multiple tens of gigabytes of storage throughput. Think of that, storage throughput on a workstation. More than that is that we can access any place in memory with nanosecond latencies. And that's compared to uh, NAND. So we're seeing a huge uh, bump in storage capability which is really important because as a data scientist, 90% of your time is gonna be spending uh, coming up with these representative data sets that are clean for training. Um, then there's a second, um, we're, we're changing the HPC software layer. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you know what POSIX is, I don't have time to go into detail on it, but basically it was developed a long time ago. Everybody uses it on all, the, all your, uh, it's basically files and a file system. And the problem is, is that's a scalability um, issue. So what we have now is Dallas was, uh, which is distributed asynchronous object storage, is designed to get rid of all those problems. The first production deployment, um, and basically um, the HPC community is going all in on this, is it's going to be running, that will be uh, basically the data access on the first USX scale system. And it's designed to work with these devices, with these uh, flash devices, to actually deliver those nanosecond latencies. And um, basically, the way it does that um, is that the DAO storage engine runs in user space and the CPU can talk directly to these storage devices. There's no operating system call, there's no page cache, there's no uh, virtual file system layer. You just go directly and get the data just like you do from memory. So that's something to look at. Next is, remember how I've been jumping up and down in this talk on how when we mimic mother nature? Well, there's something called neuromorphic computing, which real brains actually don't work the way that artificial neural networks uh, run at all. It uses a spiking neuron approach. I don't have time to go into that, but here's a proceedings of the National Academy paper um, showing that on vision recognition problems, neuromorphic computing devices like the, uh, the IBM project, the Synapse, or the uh, uh, Intel approach, the uh, LOHI or the Qualcomm projects, all these, all these others um, have the same predictive accuracy of classifying images as conventional methods, okay? So here's actually a picture of a neuromorphic computer which has the same neuronal capacity as a rat brain. These things are extraordinarily power efficient, okay? So we're doing basically between 25 and 275 milliwatts per classification. Well, 
supercomputers now run on giga on on mega uh, watts of power and cooling is a problem our brains consume 10 to 20 watts so what we're seeing is the industry transitioning to a more mimicking of mother nature's um, uh, kind of a computational model and my guess is, is that we will see internet of uh, things devices that actually run just by the temperature difference between the de uh, device and the ambient air because they're so power efficient so it's going to completely change the the community the other is remember how i was saying that you'll uh, as a data scientist you'll spend 90 percent 80 90 percent of your time messing with data the neuromorph computers actually choose their own data what you do is you define the function of interest that they learn to so that's an area to look at right now it's hot it's it's a great way to make a name for yourself um so this is uh, my famous from Hello World to Exascale Computing, which I use in my uh, uh, teaching classes. And it's famous because I say it's famous. I mean, you probably have never heard of it. So basically what we see is in the blue is what runs on the, on the processor. And we go through and we say, hello world. And then we initialize some data. And we call this black box optimization function, which you see is expressed over here. Well, this is just a transform and reduce. So what we're doing is computing this, uh, this partial error and we just sum it over the examples on each device. And then we can do that in parallel on the, uh, on the CPU. And guess what? It runs really fast and we're able to get uh, petaflops of performance. I, I get that on, on the tax supercomputers all the time. Or we get uh, teraflops to petaflops performance on our GPUs. Well, now there is a, a new method. Of course, we have the data transport. Now we have a new method called OpenACC, which is why you see an OpenACC book in, in, on my brag slides, um, where we can actually have the same kind of pragma-based programming approach, uh, which you can mix in the same program. So you can actually run on CPUs and GPUs. So whatever happens to be there, the compiler generates the right code for you. So basically, in summary, what we're seeing is a potential for extraordinary breakthroughs in scientific insight all throughout the community. Um, so you've been great. Thanks, and um, uh, what, I'll, what I like to do at the end is, here's just a bunch of use cases just to give you some pictures of what people are doing as of about eight months ago. Look through the industry, but one of the beautiful examples on speeding the path to fusion energy, um, it turns out that the, uh, the sphere that the scientists are using um, in their test cases, uh, that they hit it with a bunch of lasers and gener to generate a plasma, that wasn't the right shape. They used a machine learning algorithm to learn it. They actually got a much better shape and they're actually using machine learning to control the plasma and, and anticipate where it's gonna go. That's why we're starting to get um, uh, longer and longer sustained fusion. And that's uh, one path to saving our planet, ourselves, and meanwhile, continue our convenient lifestyle based on a lot of power. Uh, understanding the standard model, the universe, <laughs> Uh, revolutionizing drug discovery. Uh, I gave you the first examples that we use to generate funding. Of course, I can't tell you about the rest of the work we did because that's proprietary. Um, but um, people are really jumping in on that, looking for new particles in physics. It just depends on where you want to go. Looking at earthquakes, every, it's just all throughout the HPC industry. For forecasting fog, uh, HPC is actually going into the courtroom now. So if you want to become a consultant, uh, courts are now becoming open to the ideas of evaluating things in the cloud. So like I said, you've been great. There's a huge amount of information here. You've got this talk to refer back to in the recording. No deniability on my part. Meanwhile, I'm happy to make my slides um, available. Uh, but basically, y'all have been great. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions?